Hi guys, Chris and Bishop here. Hope you guys are having an absolutely great day. And a little start to show today, believe it or not, another ball python. This is what they call a high white pite. And she, she's just a normal pite. Um, nothing, I should just got a double check. I think it's a she. It's actually Michelle's ball python. It's not my ball python. I'm actually just stealing her stuff for the show. Um, I'll probably hear it later when she edits the video. Today I'm going to talk about the top five worst snakes for beginners. And what I mean by top five worst snakes, I'm not going to go into species as such. I'm going to go into categories, what you need to avoid for. So now you've been to a couple of expos, you've got a friend that's keeping snakes, or somehow you decided, well, I like the way snakes are collectible and I just like them in general. So I want to start keeping them. Here's the top five things you need to avoid as a first time keeper. And when I say first time keeper, um, within the first year or so, you've got to watch out for these snakes because you can probably start out with a good uh, beginner species. For example, one of the, the more favorable beginner species is ball pythons. I mean, the reason they're called ball pythons, this one's still a young youngster, and the younger they are, the, the more they tend to do it. But they actually form a little ball. They put their head in there so predators can't get to it. And these little pythons are ideal for, for beginners. Um, they've got a couple of warning labels on them in the sense of they love going on hunger strikes and that will normally freak out a first time keeper the other thing is they're not as super simple as colubrids in the sense of there's some basic husband requirements that you need to meet but if you go watch our previous videos on sticking to the basics you'll actually see if you stick to the basics and you've got your setup right and you've got your hot site and your cold site and you've got your humidity figured out these guys are very simple to keep okay but let's jump into the five categories and the five snakes you need to avoid as an amateur or as a beginner. I don't like using the word amateur. I've actually met more amateurs, first time keepers, got more knowledge from doing research on a species than guys have been keeping for three or four years. Um, but the first category, venomous snakes. I know it sounds cool. It looks cool. Um, and the picture in your mind of working with this dangerous venomous snake sounds pretty cool. I can maybe impress my friends with this. Not a good idea. Um, a couple of things. Venomous snakes, by nature, is a lot more confident in biting and striking because they know what they've got. They know they've got venom. Also, when you get bitten, especially on the exotic venomous stuff, is the treatment in South Africa is going to be an absolute nightmare. And with our current situation we're standing at now, um, even with our indigenous venomous, it's not a good idea. In the sense of we we've got a very low supply of anti-venom at the moment so we're trying to save the anti-venom it just stays like this it's almost like you want to take a bite out it looks like an apple um the reason is we've got a low supply of anti-venom and we actually try and keep those for real emergencies people that got bitten by accident um or people that really deserve it if you kept a venomous snake and you actually look for trouble uh it's a bit controversial do you do you deserve the anti-venom or not so but yeah um avoid venomous for the first time keepers and don't get me wrong this is a touchy subject um especially the youngsters for some reason we've got this crave amongst the youngsters that it becomes an ecocentric thing for them and i'm saying it as, as it is because that's what i see is happening i've seen a lot of youngsters um, getting into the venomous, the boreal bush vipers, the gaboon vipers, um, hardcore stuff, and they keep it responsible. Um, and they they work carefully and they, they put a lot of effort in it. If you look at them, they've got some past experience. It's not the first time that they went out and bought the most venomous snake. Um, but if you're out there and you want to start, and I think, oh, my first snake should be a king cobra, uh, we, we might have to do ego check on you, if that makes any sense. The thought of owning a king cobra or black mamba or anything that that highly extremely venomous sounds cool it's not all jokes and ego is going to go out the door once you get bitten then it's going to become a very serious matter and to put your life on the on the matter uh, or, or on the line for something like that it's just not worth it i'm not attacking the youngsters i mean i've seen all the guys that go into the snake industry he's got the money now and the first thing he wants to buy is the most venomous expensive snake um just just don't do that you're going to regret the decision down the line and you're going to end up hurting or even worse killing yourself so i do not recommend venomous as a first time keeping snake then the other thing we don't we go to the expos and we go online we see pictures 
of something like this. It's cute, it's small, and it's just adorable. I mean, I don't I don't keep ball pythons. These are all Michelle's ball pythons. But I mean, even I have to admit, this is cool. How big does it get? Okay, ball pythons, different category. But um, bio constrictors, yellow anacondas, um, reticulated pythons. I love reticulated pythons. Um, especially the hatchlings. They are super cute. I wish they could stay that small, but then I'd be keeping my entire rack system will be full of them. But reticulated pythons, you, you're ending up with a snake that's going to end up four and a half, five meters plus. Um, that's a big snake. And for every three, there's not really a rule of thumb, but I'll say for every three meters of snake you've got there, you need an extra handler. And if they do get a hold of you from the three, four meter mark, they will rip you to shreds to the extent where you're going to go to hospital and get stitches. Um, a couple of my mates actually has got lifetime scars of stitches that's up to the bone. As I'm going along, I'm going to try and remember to put an insert, insert of venomous, venomous snakes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the giants, bio constrictors, Burmese pythons, reticulated pythons, anything that goes over the three meter mark. Um, be very careful as a first time keeper. Um, for a couple of reasons. Number one is the size. The manage manageability of that snake becomes a bit more difficult as it goes bigger. Number two is space. Is You need to supply that snake with adequate space so it's not cramped. So you can't keep a two, three meter red python in a setup like this. You've got to grow the snake as uh, the setup's got to grow with the snake, if, if that makes sense. So you can't now buy a two meter enclosure for little hatchling Burmese or um, reticulate python or whatever you decide to get. You need to adjust as the snake is growing, otherwise you're just gonna stress the snake out. But you need to get ready that you're gonna end up taking up an entire room like this. And this is the reason I don't keep them. For me personally, they, they waste space. They take a lot of space up. Once we start our new facilities next year, then we'll look at reticulate pythons and those will be purpose-built concrete cages for reticulated pythons. But Personally, at the situation I'm in now, with our breeding rooms all over the basement here, it's just not going to be um, beneficial for me to keep them. And also, it's basically just me and Michelle. Um, but on the bigger dangerous stuff, it's just me. So I don't want something, uh, I don't want to call a buddy the whole time. It's like, oh, okay, I've got to move Johnny the Python today. Can you come and help me? So be careful of the giants. Then the third category, I call these extreme environment um, snakes. So these snakes, to give you an example, a green tree python. A green tree python needs an extremely accurately set up uh, tropical um, environment. So your humidity has got to be above a certain humidity and it's got to be maintained above that. So I need to know at this stage my substrate, my heat levels. And people hear humidity and think, oh, well, I'll just chuck in a bunch of coconut husk in there, get it all wet and all sorted and it'll be just humid. It's not that easy. Humidity and moisture um, in the sense of wetness, it's got nothing to do with each other. Something can be wet but not humid. And something can have a little bit of water and can be extremely humid. It's all how you control the ventilation, the circulation and your heating elements in that environment. It will create that environment. And this goes on the other side of the spectrum as well. Your extreme desert dwelling species. Um, stupid example, um, horned adders, many horned adders. They're not as simple as people make them. Um, they can be, number one, they're venomous. Number two, if they get humidity, the same levels as what a ball python would get, they're going to start running into respiratory infection problems. Um, so then you've got to put in extremely well ventilated areas. You've got to keep the water bowl well away from the heat source, not to create extra humidity. So this is what I mean by extreme um, temperature or extreme environmental different different snakes. So your tropical and your desert, not a good keeper. What, what you want is you want a snake that can actually survive in both environments. Um, for example, most king snakes and corn snakes, they can do a bit of a humid or a bit of a dry setup. It doesn't really affect them. It doesn't have to be the one extreme to the other extreme. Um, with some snakes, they need to stay outside that middle boundary, either in the humidity side or in the dry side, if that makes any sense what I'm saying. So get something that is pretty versatile in the sense of the environment that, that, that it needs to stay in. Um, a stupid example stuff we've got that falls in that boundary is spotted pythons and our children's pythons. They can be arid and they can be human species. I've kept them under both conditions and they thrive under both conditions. Not 
over 80% humidity, not on 20% humidity, but they can stay close to those boundaries and still do well from, let's say, the 40 to the 60, 70% humidities. Um, not a big issue for them whatsoever. This is a subject for South Africa exclusive, but the one is international as well. Watch out for wild caught specimens. Wild caught specimens can either be imports or it can be stuff that's been caught out of the wild locally. Um, let's cover the first one, imported wild caught specimens. You take, for example, Boagas, Emerald Tree Boas, um, the list goes on, especially more the high end stuff. If you get a high end thing for a little bit cheaper than what you would normally pay, you can already start questioning mark, uh, questioning the whole transaction. Wild caught specimens, number one is parasites, number two is they acclimatize pretty difficult in captive environments. So you got to know exactly how to figure that snake out and that's more for the advanced keepers. Do not start playing with a wild caught snake on your first try. And also for the South African stuff, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff, an example when I started out with snakes, I couldn't understand. I would get a puff adder, wild caught, from the Western Cape, have it up and established in our Northwest Province facility and they would barely up within a year. And I just couldn't understand that. And if a snake, if we get one or two mortalities a year, I'm up in arms. And I couldn't understand why puff adders of all things is now messing up my mortality rate. And then I started speaking to other expert keepers and I realized they've got the same review, is your coastal puff adders doesn't do well on inland. Um, as what our puff adders there, for example, would do. So um, brown house snakes even, even the easiest snake that we can get and get our hands on wild caught um, can be difficult because they, number one, what was their diet, uh, whether on geckos and lizards, uh, well, good luck getting them onto mice, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna struggle. Um, and even if they are eating mice, they're gonna want live mice. And then we're gonna do a whole thing on live rodent feeding. Um, Sometimes there is no way around that. But number one, it is against the law in South Africa. Um, and number two, you're risking injury to the snake. So I personally would not go that route. If I can choose, I would do frozen thought on everything that I do. It just makes my life so much easier. And also the permit issue. So if you've got a wild caught specimen, the only province that exempts you from that is the Natal province. Um, that is good and bad because now you're thinking, ooh, Natal, I must need to move there because now I can keep all the snakes I want. The problem is you can only keep it in that province. You can't just get it out. There's a lot of, there's some paperwork you need to do to get it out. Um, where I am in the Western Cape province, we need a permit from a corn snake all the way up to a Bowlands python. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But the good thing is I can basically take my snakes everywhere in the country. And we do have some indigenous stuff here. We've got some Aurora house snake. We've got some... Um, horned adders, many horned adders, burg adders that we busy up. We're actually getting in some uh, red adders, the Vita Shibuidas. Um, great snakes to work with. Small little vipers, but they're all on permit. Um, and I had to get them from a facility in the Northwest province that already had them on permit. So I can't just go catch a snake out of the bush and now apply for a permit because I need something they call legal proof of origin. I need to prove that that animal was obtained legally from a legit collection. The last little point you got to watch out for. You get snakes like ball pythons, corn snakes, most king snakes, uh, even your milk snakes. That is calm by nature. Um, if you do get a bitey ball python, you're going to calm them down eventually. Um, there's a lot of species. If they're hatchlings, they might be a little bit jittery, nervous, and might throw a lunge or two at you. But then you get snakes that were born with just rage and anger and they woke up choosing violence every day of the year. Um, these, for example, include most of your carpet pythons, for example. I have noticed if I come across a friendly carpet python, I'm in seventh heaven and I can't get enough of that snake because the ones I'm working with and the ones I've seen in friends collections are all absolute murderers. They want to kill you all the time. And I'm not generalizing, but they are more aggressive in nature. Green tree pythons, emerald tree boas, Blood pythons. Blood pythons doesn't have that name just because they uh, look cool. They've got a, they're called blood pythons for a reason. So you get snakes that is aggressive by nature. And that is the omnis on you. I can't now go and list every single species, but on the top of my head, um, 
go Google it. Um, if, if I think of our collection, if I just go through here, yeah, the Spotted in the Children's, they're pretty calm. Um, Amazon Tree Bows, they're born with an axe in the hand. They just want to kill you all the time. Um, controversial Little Snake, um, uh, Ochi Locality and Galen Dwarf Pythons. They hissy, if you approach them wrong, they will take a strike at you, but yeah, and the rest are all now, I'm just going down the rack system here. On the top there, I've got a Woma. Um, also, not as friendly as people think. Um, they, they calm down pretty well when, when, once they're out the enclosure, but they will just go on and start nipping into you, and that nip's pretty bad. Um, you can also ask me how I know this. I've been, I've been nipped by a couple of Womas, and I'll tell you what, it's not a pleasant bite. Um, a defensive bite from a ball python like this, it's not this not not that bad at all um but yeah this guy's gone completely ball python mode and um he's normally pretty chilled but uh, still a youngster we only got him i got him for this was michelle's birthday present at, at the expo and um growing up to a fantastic snake but yeah um <laughs> this actually it's actually not a good sign it means he's stressing out so i'm gonna end this show and i hope this helps for if you're in the market for a snake and you're a new keeper, what to avoid, what to look out for, what not to do. Um, and we're actually going to do a whole series within the next week or two on the top five best snakes to look at category wise. Okay, guys, so please remember to like and subscribe our channel. Hope you enjoyed the show. If there's anything you want to say, leave it in the comments and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Guys, have a great day. Cheers. Bye.